Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of All Day Edify the Show. I'm Natasha, and this is my husband, Corey, and we're your hosts. Absolutely. You know what? Uh, we're excited to be back with you today. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we welcome you to All Day Edify, and we just have an exciting show today. Absolutely, we do. So today, we are continuing in our series, Dealing with Mindset Change for Men. And although we will be presenting some concepts that apply to both men and women, it's like you always say, babe, some of the things going wrong in our community and, and in our homes mostly yeah. begins with men and fathers. And it is an opportunity for men to take responsibility and change the perception and image that people have about men being accountable. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm really proud to see that there are so many men who are embracing uh, the concept of being accountable for the things going on around them. You know, uh, it's an ongoing effort. We embrace the responsibility and the accountability, but it just don't stop. And so because it doesn't stop, it's always important. And I believe that when we see the statistics and the data and everyday perceptions are changing, we'll see that the numbers are rising in the right direction. We're seeing more men, more fathers, more husbands, more single men, whoever, regardless, men in the community taking ownership of what's going on and then taking steps in the direction of impact and change. Absolutely. And we want to help make this change a reality. So our topic for today's show is titled Mindset Change After Incarceration. Yes, yes. And this is a very thought provoking topic. In fact, it's dealing with a specific demographic. We're talking about people, males within the community who are incarcerated for whatever reason and are determined to, once they come back into the community, having paid their debt to society, take some corrective steps to do some preventive things to make sure that number one, they're not going back into those situations and that they're able to be positive contributors to society once they come out. And so based on that, we're talking about some, some uh, if we look at the data here, we can show it there, babe. Um, we have here where it shows that more than 2.3 million people in the US are in prison. 60% of those people are parents. And then here in the state of Michigan alone, 68% of the people who are incarcerated don't even have a high school diploma. All right. And so what we are doing here today is we want to shed some light on that. And we have a special guest to help us with that. Absolutely. But when you talk about those statistics is uh, the good news is there are great improvements being made in helping them transform their lives once they pay their debt and they're able to return to their communities. And so with us today, we have a man who is committed to helping them in their efforts. Yep, that's the right. Founder and executive director of the MAID Institute, Leon L. Alamin. Good to have you with us, Leon. What's going on, good brother? Evening. Good evening, good evening. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Absolutely. So it is such a pleasure for us to be able to spotlight you as one of our superheroes in our community in this segment. So could you please tell us and our viewers a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So again, my name is Leon Abdullah El Alameen. I am a lifelong resident of the city of Flint. Born and raised, been here my whole 41 years of my life. Grew up on Flint's north side in a single parent household. Mostly of my adolescent years of life was right being raised by my grandmother. And as I got a little older by my mother, who raised myself and, and, and my other siblings. Um, I grew up in the area of Flint at that time during the, uh, the 90s and 80s, where it was a lot of crime and uh, violence taking place on Flint's north side. And I had a lot of that um, experience also taking place within my household. So I came up in a time and era where, you know, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. And and because of that environment, you know, it also um, played a major role in some of my decision making and my upbringing as I was coming of age. <clears throat> Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And we can all relate to that. Real talk, Leon, you and I, we like family, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, we've known each other for a long time and uh, we've shared some lifestyle experiences. We have those things in common. And so, um, but at the same time, you are, you and I also have in common that we have embraced mindset change, right? Um, I'm extremely impressed. And I want to point this out too, man. I'm extremely impressed with the same way that I saw you, you know what I'm saying? You and I again had the same things in common. The same passion that I saw you demonstrate hustling, I see you with that same passion in giving back to the community and trying to help impact other people's lives. Um, so what's a big reason? What's the driving point behind that? We Another thing we have in common is that, you know, we're uncles, we're big brothers, but we're both fathers. How does being a father, that role as being a father, how does that impact the way that you go about uh, contributing to the community? Man, you know, um, being a first-time father has really changed my life on so many levels. And, um, you know, I have a little eight-year-old, little Leon, he's a junior. And, okay. you know, he's he's like my biggest inspiration. He's He motivates mm -hmm. me to continue to do this work that I'm doing because I know how it feels to grow up without having a father in the household or having positive male role models around you when you're coming of age. You know, um, it's hard, man. You know, I, I, I think my mother for the many sacrifices that she made and the role she had to play at times being the father and the mother. But I also understand as I got older, you know, a woman can't teach a man how to be a man. And at the end of the day, it's some life lessons and things that only a man can teach another man how to be or a young man that's growing of age to be, to be more productive, to be more positive. And so my life experiences, man, is um, driven by my son's, um, bright future i see him having you know what i mean absolutely it's a beautiful thing man it's a beautiful thing it keeps me humble it keeps me um you know just inspired man i can't really explain it he was really has changed the way i think and how i move in life you know definitely gotcha wow that is that is amazing and one of the questions that i have too in conjunction with that why does providing support to men returning to their communities mean so much to you that's, uh, that's a real good question. You know, being a formerly incarcerated man, I understand the many barriers that we face when we're being released from prison and given a second opportunity to come back out into society. Um, I experienced it firsthand when I was released after doing seven years in the Michigan Department of Corrections, um, how hard it was to find housing, employment, um, education, even trying to just get into school and, and do the right thing, being denied. You know, even after you served your time, you're, you're um, given a second sentence. You know, so society has systematically structured individuals like myself and who have felons out of the mainstream and, and, and has kept us at bay from being able to be productive citizens and and, and set us up for failure to continue the, um, the cycle of recidivism. And so, you know, it's um, for me that drove me. I recognize that um, straight out the gate because it's, it's part of my real life experience. You know, but um, because of my, my my transformation while incarcerated, through um, gaining knowledge of self, um, spirituality, um, exercise, and just also to being motivated by seeing the the damage that I caused in my own community because of the lifestyle I once used to live and seeing the impact that it had when I came home, it was um, all the motivation I needed to just drive me to really get out here and be first a community activist and then ultimately um, build into where I'm at now. Good, good. I love it, man. I love it. And so uh, one of the questions that I have for you, you mentioned how you kind of encountered some things when you first uh, returned back to the community. Uh, what are some of the most challenging things uh, that you face when you returned uh, back to the community yourself, trying to get your life back on track? I would say the number one thing was stigma. You know, the way people view individuals who are returning back into the community after um, being incarcerated, you know, such a, a negative stigma. People think you're always going to be this monstrous type of person um, that you can't change your life. You know, so I think um, first and foremost is the stigma. And then, you know, some of the most critical things like basic necessities that, that allows one to even be able to maintain and survive out here. Like I mentioned earlier, was like the things, simple things like housing and employment. You know, it's one. It's easy to tell a person to, to, to um, you know, come out here and do the right thing. But if there's no resources, if there's no mentorship, and there's um, things like that, you know, it's easy to fall back into those traps. So those would be some gotcha. of the things. Wow. 
Gotcha. So um, what do you think that out of out of those things that you experienced, uh, what did you target as the biggest uh, thing you wanted to tackle in terms of to help correct some of those ills that you faced? You know, um, mind change, changing my mindset. You know, um, I couldn't be of any of importance or help to anyone until I began to change my thinking. You know, and that started to take place when I was incarcerated. And, um, you know, I, as I, I always um, mention this to a lot of folks, when I first went in, um, being a uh, first time offender and everything, I was put into a high max um, level security, 22 hour lockdown. So I only had two hours out of the day, every day to even go outside, exercise or do whatever. And I was in there with a lot of lifers, people who never come home. And that was a real reality check for me. You know, and I end up meeting some solid individuals, man, who um, once we created this bond, they became like mentors to me. And, and they just seen things in me that I didn't see in myself. And they helped me pull that out, man. And um, I knew then that I had to change the way I was thinking because all it takes is one bad decision can cost you your whole life. And I, and, and I got friends to this day, just that one, one bad decision cost them their whole life. And so I knew I had to change my way of thinking. And I knew that was also a big part of why I was even in prison because I really lost my stuff out here. You know, a former street hustler and living that lifestyle, I was involved in many um, negative things that was having an impact on my life and also the ones I love lives. And so definitely I would say mindset, you have to change your mindset. Absolutely. Wow, and that's definitely a good, you know, segue into, you know, what I'm gonna ask you um, in a minute. But like you said, that's definitely a mindset change and that really gels with our series that we are having with the mindset change for men. And mm -hmm. so we did have some data here and kind of what it shows is, it shows that there is a decline in the prison population in Michigan. So we can just kind of see how it just kind of was like a little roller coaster, but now you can kind of see where it's a decline. Why do you think that is? Um, it's a combination of things. And uh, I'm smiling because I that really, uh, showed that data. That's one of our community partners, Safe and Just Michigan. And um, I actually um, have collaborated with them a lot. But a big part of that is kind of like programs like ours at the Nate Institute when um, shifting the narrative from instead of punishment to um, restore like a more restorative justice and healing type of um, approach. And when you have resources and things like that in which like what we're providing housing, um, job training, um, job opportunities, financial literacy and mentorship, et cetera, these things are critical. These are the things that individual needs just on the basic levels of even just trying to um, reintegrate and just to, uh, adapt to begin to even do something constructive with their lives. And so I think that's a big part of it. Now that you have a lot more awareness, a lot more groups and, and a lot more people being educated and starting to get involved and recognize the seriousness of if we don't support individuals who eventually will be coming back into the communities in which we live, um, we're only going to be repeating that same cycle of self-destruction and that hurts the community as a whole. Gotcha. Got you. And I see you got your, uh, we talk about how the uh, superheroes in the communities got their capes on. I see you wearing it out there like your Superman badge <laughs> out front. That's the main institute, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Money, attitude, direction, and education, man. This is my baby right here. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit community development reentry corporation that was established in 2015. You know, and our mission is to do those things that we didn't mention is just to provide those comprehensive um, services and programming for individuals coming back out or who already been out and have criminal histories or even at risk youth in the areas of mentorship, life skills, uh, transitional housing, workforce development, social advocacy and, and justice work, um, really re-educating individuals on how to adapt and how to better their lives is what um, the mission and vision of MAID is. And we've just been uh, very thankful that a lot of people is beginning to see the relevance and the, and the importance of some of the work that we have been doing. And, and it's just been a blessing, man, because it's definitely needed. Absolutely. One of the things that I noticed on your website is I think it said that there were over a hundred people whose lives have been changed. I don't know if that number has gone up um, since it was posted, but over a hundred people whose lives have been changed. And there are a lot of people, I want to say like 18 people who, have committed themselves as volunteers as well. Um, 
it has that number gone up in terms of the number of lives that have been changed. Um, and it, it has. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, definitely we got to update that. Our, actually, our, uh, our website, the numbers have jumped um, dramatically. Um, mm -hmm. I think we probably posted that a couple of years back. We, we're, we're close to now, um, close to serving over a thousand some people that we done reached out to and, and went through our programs or, on some kind of level. And we have like a 90% success rate of no one yeah. returning back to prison. So, you know, those numbers have definitely went up, man. And, and I'm, I'm very proud and um, thankful that we've been able to be that successful thus far. Gotcha. Gotcha. Good to hear that. Now, I know my wife got a couple questions, but I got one more I want to ask you before she get to hers. All right. Um, do you believe, because I, I saw another interview that you did, um, and I read and researched about this ban the box. Do you believe that those statistics that we talked about, how um, the incarceration rate has declined, do you think that the initiatives such as uh, the ban the box, these things have impacted those numbers as well. I know you said that you contributed to that locally um, being implemented here in Michigan, which took place in 2018. Absolutely, absolutely. I was um, also had the opportunity to collaborate with Safe and Just in Michigan and several others on the Ban the Box, Box initiative. Um, you know, I was there when um, they announced that um, it was gonna be passed and then the county and so forth. You know, and, and definitely things like Ban the Box, the Clean Slate is another one in which that recently just got passed by the governor in April, where they uh, made some adjustments and tweaks to the expungement law, which made a lot more people eligible um, to get their records expunged and um, be able to really move forward in their lives and, and quit being hindered because of a feather that they may have caught 10, 15, 20 years ago. Absolutely. And that goes back to that advocacy piece. You know, um, there's a lot more people being more aware of the significance of um, that there needs to be criminal justice reform on multiple levels, state, federal and local levels and so forth. And a lot more groups you're starting to see is um, getting more involved and in tackling certain issues that plays a part into dismantling currently what the criminal justice um, stands for right now. Good, good. Okay, so now I do have a couple questions for you. So now that you've told us what your organization stand for, the acronyms for MADE, um, Money, Attitude, Direction, and Education, out of the organization's focus area, which do you think is most important and why? Mm, that's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> um, again, back to the basic necessities, so housing. You know, shelter is important, um, but not just shelter. Sometimes, a lot of times, a lot of individuals who have committed uh, crimes and things go to prison, um, they committed those crimes in those households or those environments in which they come from played a major role in why they ended up where they ended. And so one of the first things we, we try to tackle is housing. But our transitional housing is a little different. We, we created, um, we took homes and rehabilitated them and made them more like college dorms and spaces for learning and safe spaces for really allowing individuals to really focus their minds and begin to reevaluate themselves and if they're serious about changing their lives. So I would say housing would probably be the first and foremost one. And then, cause it's kind of hard to, you can you can give a lot of knowledge to a person, but if they can't, um, they don't have safe housing, they're out in the cold and um, really can't provide for themselves. It's kind of hard for them to expect them to keep that knowledge and take it serious and run with it. So I would say housing, and then right after housing, we try to begin the, um, the job readiness and get them a job. We know they need to begin to um, pick up new habits and learn how to maintain for themselves. And then um, my third one, if I can um, give it a kind of like in that order, so it'll be housing, jobs, and then the, um, the mental health, the mental health side of things. Um, I want to say about 90% of the individuals who are incarcerated or um, a lot of those who end up going to prison prior have mental health issues, whether it's substance abuse, drug abuse, um, been, been, been sexually um, you know, raped or things like that. We are dealing with um, a population that has been suffering a lot of trauma that, that hasn't been properly addressed. And, I, and that's a big uh, disservice and that also caused to um, a lot, why a lot of individuals do some of the things that they do. So definitely addressing that mental health side of things is very important. And and when, when you mentioned the mental health piece, I know that even just with your organization um, within itself, but even with the pandemic, I'm sure it's heightened, you know, with the whole 
mental health piece um, being a concern. Um, and I just know that that right now for how this pandemic is going has really been a rise now that you mentioned mental health issues. Um, so what about the focus on workforce development and violence prevention, um, which can have the biggest impact on encouraging mindset change in communities where violence is a way of life? You know, um, I'm a big, strong component of workforce development, and that consists of many things. Um, we focus a lot right now on skilled trades just because it's a high demand, um, especially in like places like Flint and Detroit, where there's a lot of redevelopment. There's a lot of um, um, deconstruction, tearing down old buildings and things like that, and it's very felony friendly. And so um, you have a short window when individuals are being released from, from prison to jail to really get their attention and have them focus enough to where you got to give them something tangible, you know. And so um, I'm a I'm huge, huge fan of the workforce development side of things. Technology plays a role also in that workforce and, um, development side. That's where the, the society and world is, is, is at now, you know, and uh, a lot of individuals have been locked up for quite some time. So you really have to... Um, kind of like walking a child and, and taking baby steps with individuals, bringing them up and educating them on the technology side of things. So I would say workforce development first, and then um, the other things kind of play a role into it as you you build a report with an individual. Um, and each individual sometimes is a little different. So not um, certain things may not be good for this person that may be good for another person. But um, with our social workers and things, we, we, we figured out out through building those reports and relationships with them. Got you. Very good. Uh, we, we're, we're getting limited on time. So I, I have an important question that I wanted to ask. Um, how dangerous do you think that timing is for people when they are living a criminal lifestyle, right? Again, something both you and I are familiar with, but <laughs> now you want to take steps in the direction of a mindset change. How critical is timing? Timing is, is, is very critical very critical um, um kind of just what i was uh, mentioning earlier you have a short window of really trying to um keep the attention of individuals who coming out of structured environments that the prison system is set up to be and then coming back into the free society where everything is as you please and now you have to uh, fend for yourself and you know whether it's food um feeding yourself clothing all those things and if you got kids that's a whole nother level and layer of situations and responsibilities so timing is critical and that's why like in the first 30 days 30 to 60 days we go very hard um with individuals who are coming like into our transitional housing and really um trying to get them up and going and get them connected with a mentor and if we can't provide it get them to um other agencies that may have services that we may not have at the time to really get them on the um in going in the right direction because uh if not you know it's just a matter of time these streets to be calling and, and that's something like you said we both are familiar with the lure of fast money um, yeah. loose women or whatever that situation may be for certain individuals to be it's just a matter of time so timing is critical yeah i agree yeah. okay so let's say that i'm willing to make a mindset adjustment what programs do you think will be a good fit for me to feel an immediate impact and encourage me to feel like i made the right decision hmm what programs hmm so let me let me if I can if I can enhance that question because I love that question. Let's look at it from a perspective of somebody who has not gone into incarceration, right? Okay. okay. Somebody who has not gone into incarceration, but they want to be proactive and like you know what I want to change my mindset. You know what I mean? So what programs do you think would be beneficial for that person? Okay, for that person, um, I would definitely first and foremost would say knowledge of self. And what I mean by that, especially if you um, a, a black person, a lot of times we have been miseducated on who we are, where we come from. Um, as you study and see, that's why we have this school to prison pipeline. The public school system was set up for us to be um, programmed a certain way as workers and miseducated us on our history. And it's hard to really um, be and develop and be the best person or human being that you can be when you don't even know where you come from your true history, things where you can pull from that can give you inspiration, inspire you and give you courage. I know one of the first books I picked up when I was incarcerated was Malcolm X. And I'm a big fan of Malcolm. And what I, I pulled from Malcolm 
Malika Har Shabazz is his um what what the definition of manhood is. You know, he became like a father to me, his living example, you know what I mean? And so that's why knowledge of self is so important. That's why a lot of times you see in the inner cities, it's so easy for young folks to drift to where there's gangs or street hustlers and things. They they they're fascinated by the thing that's missing out of that a lot of times out of their household, which is a positive male figure. You know, right. someone that can really lead them on a better path. So I would say knowledge is self. And once a person begins to get knowledge of self and really get a better understanding of who they are, where they come from, and how the world um, um, kind of operates, so to say, then I think those other things where you may have aspirations, whether it's workforce development, uh, whether it's schooling, you know, academia, whether you're a person who's trying to get into school and take that route, you know, but definitely you have to know who you are, which gives you a layer of confidence to um, tackle on whatever you about to try to challenge and, and have in life in front of you. I like that. I like that. You know, one of the things that uh, we recently, and I, I think I may have brought it to your attention, that we recently did a mental health uh, event where um, the mental health specialist, uh, who's a licensed therapist, he said the same thing because he had a lot of men that he deals with is that it's so important to understand your background, understand your family uh, structure and what your DNA is so that you can then begin to understand some of the thought processes that you have, and then you can begin to redirect yourself. So I, I like that response that you give, because I think that that applies across the board. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I know, babe, that you had something you wanted. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to say that this this interview has been so good. And then we're just kind of running out on time. I wish we could continue with the interview. Um, however, we I just really want to say thank you so much, Leon, for joining us on the show. Um, could you please, before we let you go, just let our viewers know how they could connect with you regarding your organization and your program? Absolutely. Um, again, thank you guys for having me. Um, I could be reached at our, um, my, 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 my personal cell there. That's, that's up 810-835-8304. I mean, excuse me, my business cell. Um, you can reach us on our website, www.madeinstitute.org. Or if you're in the city of Flint, uh, Monday through Friday from 9 to about 2, there's always someone at the office, 503 Garland Street, Flint, Michigan, 48503. And then we also just created an app so then you can download the, uh, the Made Institute app is another way and means of uh, communicating with us and seeing what we have going on. Absolutely. That's good, man. And so I think that what I'm going to end up doing, man, I'm going to figure out a way to try to get you back on here sometime real soon, man, because there are some Look. other questions that we wanted to get to. But because the interview was going so well and you providing so much good information, man. I want to, uh, we'll figure out a way that in the real near future, yeah. man, we want to get you back on here because as a provider of resources in the community, we always want to introduce people to these opportunities to improve and better their lives. Of course, you know, our goal, our aim at All Day Edify is we want to uplift, inform, and enlighten you. All day, every day. Do you provide human services? Are you an entrepreneur that contributes to society? Do you have access to tools and resources that facilitate growth and development? Come be a guest on our show. You can email us at alldayedify at gmail.com or send us a message on our Facebook page at All Day Edify. A new TV channel, Sundial Networks, showcasing urban culture, music, lifestyle, fashion, talk shows, comedy, movies, and more. TV lineups, slow jams, game of life, sundial soul, live from the smokehouse, the battle, new versus old, 60s and 70s time machine, all that jazz. And on Sunday, special programming with religious roots, gospel soul, R&B classic gospel, you can find us on the web and on most smart TVs at www.sundial.tv. That's sundial.tv. And on Roku. Yes, Roku. Free. No subscription needed. Search for us under Sundial Networks. That's S-U-N-D-I-A-L Networks. Sundial Networks. From the great city of Flint, Michigan, Sundown Networks presents live.
at the Golden League with the Eclipse Band featuring the stars of tomorrow and Amateur Night with history in the making open mic. Watch the TV show every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. Search us on Roku under Sundial Network. Also available on most smart TVs. On the web at www.sundial.tv. That's sundial.tv. No subscription needed. Watch the TV show with the Eclipse Band featuring the stars of tomorrow. Only on the Sundial Network. Search us on Roku under Sundial Networks every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. That's Sundial.tv. Watch the TV show every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. www.sundial.tv.